Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Q1 FI23 Earnings Conference Call of Delivery Limited hosted by Morgan Stanley India Company Private Limited. Before we start, we would like to point out that some of the statements made in today's call may be forward-looking in nature and a disclaimer to this effect has been included in the earnings presentation shared with you earlier. Kindly note that this call is meant for investors and analysts only. If there are any representatives from the media, they are requested to drop off this call immediately. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star than zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Gaurav Viteria from Morgan Stanley. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you, Nirav. Hello, everyone. This is Gaurav Viteria from Morgan Stanley. Thank you all for joining us for Delivery's earnings call to discuss fiscal 23 first quarter results. To discuss the results, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Sahil Barwa, the CEO and MD, Mr. Sandeep Barasiya, Chief Business Officer, Mr. Amit Agarwal, CFO, and Mr. Varun Bakshi, the Head of Investor Relations. I thank management team for providing us this opportunity to host this call. I now invite Mr. Sahil Barwa to take us through key financial highlights for the quarter post which we will open the floor for Q&A. With that, over to you, Sahil. Thank you, Gaurav, and thank you all for joining. A very good evening to you, and welcome to our second earnings call. Just a quick check before I go ahead that I'm completely audible. Yes, are you audible? Thank you. So the agenda for this call is uh, to walk through our earnings presentation in about 20 minutes, and then we will open up for questions. Uh, Apart, if you can move to the next slide. For those of you who are joining for the first time, a brief background on delivery. The objective behind delivery is to build the operating system for commerce in India which means we essentially provide the infrastructure, the services, and the technology that allow buyers and sellers to transact with each other in the real world. These buyers and sellers may be businesses transacting with businesses, businesses transacting with consumers, or consumers transacting with consumers, both within the borders of India or from India to abroad or abroad to India. Moving to the next slide, Apar. A quick snapshot of our performance in uh, quarter one, fiscal 23. We continue to be India's largest integrated logistics platform. In quarter one of financial 23, we registered 1,746 crores of revenue from services, which represents a 30% growth over our revenues for the same quarter in the previous financial year. Quarter one, financial 23 adjusted EBITDA margins stand at negative 12.5%. We delivered 152 million parcels in our express business in quarter one financial 23 and have delivered close to about 1.6 billion packages since our inception in 2011. In quarter one financial 23 in our part truckload freight business, we delivered close to 240,000 tons of freight and have shipped close to two and a half million tons of freight since financial 19. We run one of the largest networks in the country and operate close to about 18.9 million square feet of logistics infrastructure across the country. This includes automated sortation centers, trucking terminals, air terminals, and fulfillment centers across India. We have over 29,000 active customers who work with us across multiple business lines, which include express parcel shipping, part truckload shipping, full truckload shipping, supply chain services and warehousing, and cross-border logistics. 54% of our revenue comes from customers who use two or more of our services, and we cover 18,435 PIN codes across the length and breadth of the country, as defined by the Indian Post. A quick snapshot of our key operating metrics for quarter one fiscal 23, which is the column on the extreme right. Between the end of financial 22, since our last earnings call, and the end of quarter one financial 23, we've expanded our PIN code reach from 18,074 PIN codes to 18,435 PIN codes. Our overall customer base has expanded from 23,600 customers to over 29,000 customers as of the end of quarter one financial 23. 
As discussed earlier, we've expanded our overall logistics infrastructure from 18.15 million square feet to 18.9 million square feet as of the end of quarter one financial 23. We continue to have the largest number of gateways, automated sort centers and processing centers among logistics companies in India. We operate 96 gateways across the country, 21 automated sortation centers, 189 processing centers, nearly 3,000 except delivery centers, about 240 freight service centers. And we have an overall team size of close to about 60,000 people across the country. Moving to the next slide. Key milestones for quarter one financial 23. The first is uh, one that we had referred to in our communication with shareholders earlier in this quarter, which is the completion of the operational integration of spot on. To refresh everyone's memories, spot on was a part truckload freight uh, business that we acquired earlier in financial 22. The integration was planned in three phases, which I will talk about in more detail through the call, which began quarter three of the last financial year. And the final phase of the integration was scheduled for quarter one of this year. We've expanded total infrastructure to nearly 18.9 million square feet and commissioned and taken live our automated mega facility at Taudu, Bilaspur and Haryana, which is now fully operational. We also launched a guaranteed same-day delivery service aimed at direct-to-consumer e-commerce customers um, across the country. We've also launched our consumer-to-consumer -consumer shipping application, the delivery app, for consumers to book and track consignments in real time. Our client roster has grown in quarter one as well. We've onboarded over 500 new customers in our express parcel business, and our supply chain services business continues to see robust demand for our integrated services. We've onboarded two of the world's largest auto manufacturers, a major multi-brand retailer, a global electronics major, and one of India's largest paint companies in our supply chain services business. And on the technology front, we've been awarded two US patents for our data sciences work for AdFix and UAID, which are our proprietary systems. So that's a quick snapshot of quarter one. I'll begin with a quick update on the spot-on integration. Uh, the integration of delivery and spot-on, as I pointed out, was carried out in three phases. It required us to assimilate over 2,000 members of the spot-on team, about 5,500 customers who were serviced by spot-on prior to the integration, an infrastructure of about 2.5 million square feet, which was spread across 350 operating facilities. And all of this was to be brought into the combined delivery and spot-on network. As part of phase one, which was in quarter three of the last financial year and completed successfully in December 2021, uh, our first aim was to integrate clients and teams, restructuring customer contracts for all of the 5,500 spot-on customers, ensuring parity with delivery, and integrating the spot-on team of over 2,000 people into our organization. As part of phase two, which was completed during quarter four of the last financial year in March 2022, we completed integration of client-facing and operations systems, which was a full integration of our technology system, essentially setting us up for moving all operations to a single integrated network in phase three. Phase three was begun in quarter one, uh, which was the final integration of operations, which included both the infrastructure and the network operations of both companies. The decision to complete the integration in quarter one was based on certain factors in our business. First of all, on business cyclicality, where quarter one volumes in a financial year are typically lower than quarter two to quarter four. The second was in line with our annual CapEx cycle. Delivery typically commissions new infrastructure, which goes live in quarter two and quarter three of the financial year. And so integrating prior to the commissioning of new infrastructure would allow us to bed in this infrastructure with the combined volumes. The third factor was avoiding monsoons and making sure that uh, we were essentially not disrupted by the rains across different parts of the country. And the fourth was the avoidance of the e-commerce peak season, which typically hits us in quarter three of the financial year. In quarter one, while we started the operational integration, the overall process of integrating the infrastructure and the network took longer than we originally expected. Uh, this was down to a couple of reasons. First was higher than forecasted volumes, which created bottlenecks at some of our key facilities uh, at the automated gateways in both Taudu and Vivandi but also at some of the facilities where both delivery and spot on had not established sufficient infrastructure to service incremental customer demand, which included locations like Chennai and Pune. As a consequence, we made the choice to pause volumes from a selection of key accounts and some accounts who had either specific business processes or specific requirements for freight handling, 
until operational parameters were conclusively stabilized. Operational service levels have returned to pre-integration levels. They return to pre-integration levels within a few weeks of beginning the integration have, and have remained stable since. Moving to the next slide, the impact of the integration, which I will talk about in more detail as we go through the financials, uh, first of all, has arisen from service stability. Service stabilization took us four weeks longer than originally expected at the start of the quarter, uh, largely due to the automated gateways at Gurgaon and Vivendi having a temporary effect on service precision. There were higher than normal service error related claims from customers that had to be settled during quarter one, which have caused higher revenue provisions during the quarter. And a temporary period of disruption for our pickup and delivery business partners due to a change in their serviceability as they moved from the spot on network to the combined delivery and spot on network. The proactive reduction in volumes along with the reduction from select clients uh, also affected us overall in quarter one financial 23. Uh, and we made the decision to maintain capacity across our three key resources, which are staffing, fleet, and infrastructure, to ensure service stability through the period. And as a consequence, we see slightly higher unit costs, which are elevated during quarter one financial 23, compared to quarter four of financial 22. In addition, there are one-time transition costs of the integration, which we expect will normalize over financial 23. For instance, due to commercial or contractual reasons, we have had to run a certain amount of redundant infrastructure and certain software licenses, and there are certain administrative costs from the spot-on entity that have continued in quarter one. We also paid a one-time compensation to key business partners and channel partners in quarter one to support them through our integration period, outside of which there have been substantial technology and development costs both in quarter four financial 22 and quarter one financial 23 as we've integrated delivery and spot-on systems. The overall impact is what you see uh, in the slides to follow. As you can see on the left-hand side, overall revenue between quarter one financial 22 and quarter one financial 23 has grown by about 30% year on year, from 1,344 crores to about 1,746 crores. The composition of the business has changed slightly owing to the integration effect uh, of the PTL business. ETL, which was 23% of the business in quarter one financial 22, is 15% of the business in quarter one financial 23. Express parcel revenues have grown by 34% uh, from 785 crores in quarter one financial 22 to 1,051 crores as of quarter one financial 23. This is despite seasonality in the express business where quarter one of a financial year is typically depressed and the exit of Shopee from the Indian market in quarter four of financial 22. Express partial ship, uh, parcel shipments grew strongly through this period. We have seen 50% growth year on year, uh, with Q1 financial 22 volumes of 102 million growing to 152 million for quarter one of financial 23. Part truckload freight revenues uh, have degrown by 16% between quarter one financial 22 and quarter one financial 23, going to the reasons I spoke about earlier, where we proactively shut down some client volumes for a period of time and some clients chose to proactively cut volumes as well through this period. Overall freight tonnage uh, degrew from 279,000 tons of freight to about 234,000 tons of freight in quarter one of financial 23. Moving to the next slide, our other business lines, which are the truckload business, the supply chain services business, and the cross-border services business, continued to show robust growth in line with our original plan. The FTL business has grown from 55 crores of revenue in quarter one financial 22, to over double that uh, in quarter one financial 23, registering nearly 122 crores of freight value transacted. In the supply chain services business as well, we've seen about 120% growth year on year, uh, with quarter one financial 22 having 106 crores of revenue, which has grown to nearly 240 crores of revenue for quarter one financial 23. And revenue from cross-border services, uh, excluding traded goods, has grown from 51 crores of revenue in quarter one financial 22, to 78 crores in quarter one financial 23, as our integration with FedEx has stabilized. In terms of adjusted EBITDA, quarter one financial 23, which is the third column in the table, uh, revenue from customers, as, it, as discussed, stands at 1,746 crores. We are bro broadly neutral at the service EBITDA level, with a final adjusted EBITDA of negative 217 crores, or minus 12.5%. Compared to quarter one of financial 22, 
where we had an adjusted EBITDA margin of negative 4%. So a decline in the adjusted EBITDA by about negative 8.5%. Uh, and compared to quarter four, where we made an adjusted EBITDA of 81 crores, a change of about 300 crores. Moving to the next slide, this is a quick bridge on uh, the change in adjusted EBITDA from quarter four financial 22 to quarter one financial 23. At the top of the table is the quarter four financial 22 adjusted EBITDA of 81 crores. Uh, in quarter one of the year, we typically add, as I discussed, manpower, fleet, and infrastructure capacity in anticipation of higher volumes between quarter two and quarter four. We added close to 21 crores of cost in this period, which is 2,500 additional staff, 30 trucks and 85 trailers, which is in line with our sort of larger objective of movement to trailers, and about 740,000 square feet of transportation infrastructure. As I discussed, we chose to continue and retain existing capacity of fleet, of manpower, and of infrastructure in anticipation of service recovery to ensure that service levels stayed stable and to make sure that as volumes went up, client experience was not affected. The overall cost of the underutilization of this existing capacity is to the extent of 150 crores in quarter one of financial 23. And in addition, our annual inflation cycle, which comes from wage hikes and rent escalations, has added up to 17 crores. So the net impact of B1, B2, and B3 is 188 crores. In addition, the exit of Shopee, which gave us 22 million parcels in quarter four financial 22, has an impact along with reduced revenues in the part truckload business of close to about 60 crores leading to a total reduction in service of 188 to 60, which is 248 crores, and a minor increase in corporate costs, leading to a total impact of 252 crores. Excluding one-time integration costs, which include one-time provisions for heightened claims from customers and six crore in payments to vendors as support for quarter one, the adjusted EBITDA prior to the integration cost stands at 171, negative 171 crores, and including one-time integration costs, which we do not expect will continue into quarter two and beyond, at negative 217 crores. The next slide shows a comparison versus prior periods. Uh, in steady state in quarter three financial 22 and quarter four financial 22, the business had achieved adjusted EBITDA margins of close to 4%, which in quarter one financial 23, affected by the spot-on integration, stand at negative 12.5%. The next slide is a detailed breakup of the adjusted EBITDA. Uh, total revenue from customers for quarter one financial 23 was 1,746 crores. Total expenses stood at 2,206 crores. After adjusting for non-cash expenses and adjusting for lease adjustments due to AS116 and one-time operating expenses such as our IPO expenses and a non-cash non-operating cost, uh, the adjusted EBITDA stands at negative 217 crores as discussed as compared to 81 crores for quarter four of financial 22 and negative 58 crores for quarter one of financial 22. The adjusted cash pad for the same period stands at negative 187 crores or negative 10% compared to 5% in quarter three financial 22 and 6.6% in quarter four financial 22. The adjusted cash pad bridge is the same as the adjusted EBITDA bridge with uh, more or less the same adjustments. Finally, uh, in our previous earnings call, there were a, a number of initiatives that we had outlined for financial 23. This is a quick update on where we stand on each of those. The first was the integration of the delivery and the spot-on networks. So all three phases of the integration between delivery and spot-on have now been completed. Customers and teams have been integrated. Technology systems have been integrated, and operationally, from an infrastructure and network operation standpoint, both networks stand fully integrated. And as discussed, service levels are stabilized as of the end of quarter one financial 23 and remain robust. We continue to integrate the networks and grow volume, and so we continue to realize network synergies, and we'll launch our economy PTL service uh, through financial 23. We are in the process of expanding our overall infrastructure uh, by about 4 million square feet. About 740,000 square feet has been commissioned and delivered. We continue to expand our tractor trailer fleet uh, to its full size of 150 TTs and have expanded our automated sortation capacity by 35% in this period in advance of peak season volumes. We continue to introduce new automation across our major sort centers and our hubs. 
have moved fully to system directed mid mile operations as expected with the integration of delivery and spot on we continue to expand usage of electric vehicles across our entire network and continue to pilot lng and evs in our mid mile operations our cross border express product now stands fully integrated uh, with delivery and fedex now port sharing airwaybills seamlessly our supply chain services business as discussed continues to show robust growth we've grown by nearly 120% uh, between quarter 1 of last year and quarter 1 of this year with a focus on key industry verticals like auto chemicals consumer durables and we have launched the delivery direct to consumer academy and are in the process of launching our unified client portal and our merchant panel for small and medium businesses to access all of our products we launched the delivery direct consumer to consumer shipping app and are in the process of launching our orion truckload price discovery and booking application and are in the process of launching our platform service for global third party developers along with our saas offering in select international markets so that's a brief summary of uh, financial performance in quarter 1 of uh, fiscal 23 with that i will pause and we are happy to take questions thank you very much we will now begin the question and answer session anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone if you wish to remove yourself from the question queue you may press star and two Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. The first question is from the line of Abhishek Padak from HSBC. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I had a couple of questions. Uh, the first one was, uh, you know, we are seeing some uh, sequential pressure in the global e-commerce volumes. Um, do you see something similar, or at least a deceleration happening uh, in the Indian e-commerce space, uh, you know, over the short term and the next two to three years? That's the first one. And number two, uh, there have been some questions around the viability of the uh, social commerce model, and uh, considering we have, uh, you know, uh, significant dependence. Uh, on uh, social commerce platforms for volumes uh, is this something that the company uh, sort of worries about uh, over the short to medium term thank you thanks abhishek good questions uh, let me begin with the first one which is are we seeing a slowdown in e-commerce generally in india uh, the short answer to that is not yet if you look at our volumes they have grown 50% a year between quarter 1 of last year and quarter 1 of this year from 100 million shipments to 150 million shipments even adjusting for share gain that we have we have had in this period i think that does represent growth in the market overall if you remember in our previous earnings call one of the things that we had pointed out is that while individual players were likely to see turbulence in e-commerce through this financial year uh we are pretty confident that the broad trend for e-commerce continues to be positive and when you look at uh, the underlying reason it's simply the fact that e-commerce in india is heavily underpenetrated uh you know penetration in india is less than 7% whereas comparable penetration for example in a place like china would be north of 20% and so we expect that there will continue to be a secular shift towards e-commerce going forward individual players may certainly continue to face turbulence and from a delivery standpoint as we discussed we don't have a significant dependence on any single client uh and so in that sense you know there is no impact on our overall volumes as you can see um outside of that i think your second question was around social commerce i think look the way we look at it is that a variety of players will experiment with different models in e-commerce however the broad trend towards buying online will continue uh even players who you know sort of have been bracketed under social commerce have sort of pivoted to being a mix of social commerce and more traditional big box commerce and i think irrespective of the model that different players will follow the demand from consumers will continue and given that we are the largest player and the most efficient player in the country our volumes will continue to remain stable uh so we don't see a large risk going forward abhishek line is on thank you thank you for yeah thank you for that thanks thank you the next question is from the line of hitesh from clsa india please go ahead 
Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my first question is on uh, you alluded to the fact that you've gained some market share in the e-commerce space. Can you talk about how much the industry has grown during this quarter? And uh, my second question is on profitability, right? I mean, uh, I understand this is a, on a weak quarter because of integration issues and also lower mm -hmm. volumes. But how should we look at profitability uh, over next uh, two quarters, right? When the integration benefit starts coming in, volume scale up. So if you can give us some guidance on how margins could scale up from here on. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me begin with market share in e-commerce. I think, uh, you know, again, I'll direct you first to the, uh, to the overall growth in volumes from quarter one of last year to quarter one of this year, which is from 100 million shipments that we did last year to 150 million shipments this year. So I think we certainly have gained market share in this period because the industry has not grown by 50% in a year. Between quarter four of last year and quarter one of this year, it's a little difficult to say because of the outsized impact that Shopee's exit had on the market overall. I think when you include Shopee, it's safe to say that the market has not grown between quarter four financial 22 and quarter one financial 23. Whereas when you look at our volumes adjusted for Shopee, we've remained broadly at the same 152 million mark. So when you adjust for that, I think we've gained some share in the market between quarter four and quarter one. Um, to your second question, in terms of profitability, I think uh, while we're still in the process of regaining volumes and our service levels have remained stable, we have seen recovery of volumes from all of our major customers. Uh, you know, the overall recovery will play out through quarter two as well. And so we remain optimistic about it. Uh, but the way to think about our business is pretty simple. As I've mentioned, you know, in the slide that we presented earlier, Amit, if you can just bring up that slide briefly, Amit or Apar. The bridge from 81 crore of quarter four. Yeah. If you look at this, the biggest impact really on profitability has been point B2, which is underutilization of existing capacity, which is 150 crores, and the revenue led reduction in service EBITDA which is the 60 crores. So first of all, and obviously the 46 crores of one-time integration costs. So first off, obviously we do not expect the one-time integration costs to persist through the year. The second is as volumes come back, the underutilization of existing capacity should disappear and the network should automatically become more efficient. One thing that I should point out is that this existing capacity itself will shrink a little bit going forward because we do continue to carry infrastructure. We do continue to carry certain contracts from Auton's sort of previous days, which we haven't yet fully deprecated. If you can go to the KPI slide for a second, uh, Apar, at the start of the deck. One of the things that you will see here is that the number of gateways have declined from 123 as of the end of financial 22 to 96 as of quarter one financial 23. Uh, and similarly, the number of freight service centers have declined from 267 as of the end of financial 22 to 237 as of quarter one financial 23. And so as these contracts become available for renewal or for termination, we will continue to sort of consolidate the combined delivery and spot on network and continue to sort of realize synergy going forward. So that's sort of how the excess capacity will get absorbed. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, if I can ask one more question, just a final question no. on pricing front, uh, we have seen some stability on the e-commerce pricing where it is kind of not gone down much, right? So should we expect the pricing to remain now stable or you will still, because you are the lowest price in the industry, or you will continue to prioritize market share over, uh, you know, pricing in e-commerce segment. Pricing is a strategic decision that we take at an account level. The difference in pricing that exists between any two quarters could also be because of a change of mix, for instance, or a change of the distance that parcels travel. In this case, there's obviously a big difference because of the disappearance of Shopee between quarter four and quarter one. Uh, we evaluate pricing at every customer level and depending on sort of the customer's ambitions for growth going forward and what our margin projections for each individual customer are. But suffice to say, I don't think we will be taking any significant pricing actions through the rest of the year. Great. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next question is from Mukesh Saraf from Spark Capital from webcast, slide 12, inflation impact of 17 CR, 
Could you let us know which segment this impact has primarily been felt in, as there would usually be passed through a fuel hikes to customers? Would these costs be subsequently passed through with a lag? Supply chain revenue has grown to 236 CR in the quarter. What is the total warehouse space square feet for this segment as of June end? What is the target for space addition in FY23, FY24? Is there a split between transportation and warehousing for this 236 CR, or is this entirely warehousing? Sure. Uh, let me start with the question on inflation. The overall inflation of 17 crores includes inflation due to wage hikes, inflation due to renegotiation of rental contracts, and inflation due to fuel. Uh, in the part truckload business, you're right. The hike in fuel uh, is essentially passed to, to customers entirely. Uh, and so to that effect, you know, it doesn't have any impact on, uh, on profitability directly. So majority of this comes from wage hikes and rent escalation. Given that we run an integrated network, it affects all of our businesses sort of in a conjoint fashion because our part truck road business and our express business share the same people, they share the same fleet, and they share the same uh, infrastructure. In terms of supply chain, I'm sorry, there was a question on would these costs be passed through with a lag? We discussed this earlier. Fuel inflation is typically passed through with a max lag of 15 days to customers, which is in line with sort of regular industry norms. Your question on supply chain, the revenue of 236 crores is a combination of transportation and warehousing revenues. Uh, the target for space addition in fiscal 23 is likely to be close to about 1.67 million square feet. However, I should point out that this is a projection at this point in time based on the pipeline that we have and the contracts that we've agreed. And sort of as we get closer to real-time commissioning of these and availability of space, this number may change a little bit. But I'd invite Amit, who is our CFO, to comment on question two as well. Amit, if you are on the line. Yes, hi, thank you. So um, our supply chain services business did uh, 236 crore of revenue in quarter one of FY23. Out of this, nearly 40% of revenue was attributable to the uh, warehousing services, and uh, uh, remaining was attributable to transportation. Uh, but I want to point out that nearly 90-95% of revenue in this segment is a combined contract of warehousing and transportation. It's not a separate uh, service contract. They are integrated contracts. Uh, so I pointed out that we intend to add about 1.6 7 million square feet uh, this fiscal year based on our pipeline. Out of this, we have added about half a million square feet of space in quarter one based on the contracts that we have converted and uh, uh, expansion with the existing customers. And the remaining capacity will be added as and when we get very close to the finalization uh, of the contract with the customers. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Lokesh Garg from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Just, uh, hi, sir. Good. Just wanted to have your perspective on competitive scenario that you face in the industry. Uh, obviously, there are express parcel companies uh, which are competing, which we know, but there are traditional courier companies also which we felt have not pivoted to the e-commerce business. Over a period of time, is it possible that they combined with marketplace, shipment marketplace type companies can actually sort of combine together can pivot to provide e-commerce parcel services as you do uh, and thus could rise up the ladder and be more competitive with you? And is that already happening and your perspective around that? Yeah, so our perspective on this is pretty simple, which is that shipment marketplaces have a limited strategic value to the market as a whole. Any player who is a significant shipper is better served by having direct relationships with logistics companies, you know, however many they choose to have, because their shipment volumes are large enough to ensure both appropriate price discovery as well as appropriate service discovery. And they don't really need the services of an intermediary. This isn't something that is specific to India, by the way. This is something that is seen across the world. Uh, whether you look at the U.S. where customers continue to have direct relationships with the likes of FedEx or UPS or the United States Postal Services, 
um, or in China or elsewhere. The other piece is, you know, I don't think that the reason why traditional courier companies have been unable to penetrate the market is the absence of shipment marketplaces. I think the reality is that they have not been able to address this market because the underlying models that they have are not robust enough to service the needs of e-commerce. Whether it is picking up from a widely distributed set of you know, merchants of variety of different sizes, whether it is investing in infrastructure to go out and build automated sortation centers or running line hall, you know, these are not sort of physical capabilities that are dependent on shipment marketplaces in any way. So if the question is, can sort of traditional players work with aggregators and gain market share, I'd say that that opportunity is probably extremely limited because that's an opportunity that has presented itself to traditional courier companies from before the time that delivery began as a company. And they failed to capitalize on it. And the existence of a marketplace doesn't make it more viable. Sure. Thanks. I had the second question, which is related to the three new businesses or segments or services that you started. Uh, one is uh, basically same day delivery, other is uh, C2C, and third is economy PPL. Now, what is the relevant size that we have, either in terms of total parcel opportunity or percentage growth opportunity that you can highlight to us from some of these services? And in economy PTL, I have an additional question as to economy PTL essentially is a slower PTL service. Uh, today, delivery network runs all express, right? It's a single speed network. By introducing a slow service, do you end up confusing the network? Yeah, that's a very good question. And let me answer the latter question quickly on, uh, on economy PTL. The way to think about how delivery is constructed and why we run an integrated network is think of us as essentially building a pipe and then figuring out the optimal combination of nodes that need to go through that pipe. And so in some senses for us, it's a question of being able to identify what is the appropriate truck on which to place a part truck load shipment that belongs to the economy PTL segment. So we actually see the economy PTL as a way for us to take up utilization of the express network. So to give you an example, let's say we have a truck which is ready to depart from Delhi to Bombay, which is 80% full. If we happen to have economy PTL loads, which are available and can ride on that truck, then they essentially get to ride for free. As long as economy PTL is not set up as a completely standalone capability, but is set up subservient to the integrated network, which is an express network, as you pointed out, it's actually a margin effective business which delivers a better quality of service to those customers. The second thing is that the economy PTL business typically tends to have larger LR sizes or larger weight per LR that is tendered to logistics companies. And so in that sense, is the handling costs are significantly lower for us. And so again, it becomes margin accretive. The size of the economy PTL business is the easiest way to think about it is it's about two thirds to three quarters of the overall part truckload freight market in India, because traditionally the Indian PTL market has been an economy or a slow PTL market. Increasingly though, with an improvement in highways, with an increase in truck sizes, with the presence of players like us, the market is shifting from economy PTL towards an express PTL market. So for us, economy PTL is an interesting capability that we will offer to certain kinds of shippers. We will use it to drive up utilization of our network, especially in key geographies, but it's not really a standalone capability. Um, in terms of consumer to consumer, at this point in time, it's hard to judge exactly how large that market is because this is a market that again, historically is one that has been starved of supply. You know, there aren't too many options for consumers to really shift inter-city from the comfort of their homes. They still traditionally have to walk up to a traditional retail outlet and shift, whereas now they have the ability to do that from their home. Our volume growth has been pretty robust. In peak, I think, uh, including both our direct consumer-to-consumer -consumer network as well as our franchise network, we've hit close to about a million and a half orders in a month. Uh, and that continues to grow. However, I don't have an exact market size for how big it will be. It's an interesting capability for us to add and rides on our existing business and is high margin. Uh, and your last question was uh, on the same, same day. Same day. That, that again is the capability that we've added for specific customers. Uh, we already provide same day delivery services. So in, intra city shipping is already same day delivery. In this case, all that we have done is to open up some of our delivery centers or some of our intermediate processing centers as micro fulfillment locations. 
where it is possible for certain direct to consumer brands to stock fast moving inventory with us and for us to deliver within 4 to 6 hours in a tight catchment area but again it's a service that we already provide sure if i'm allowed i have one more question which is uh, basically Uh, 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 the total parcels that you are carrying obviously originate from bulk of them originate from obviously e-commerce platform the two large ones and some of the new upcoming ones uh, such as social commerce and all that i wanted to just check with you if i have this number is are there a meaningful number of parcels now originating from omni channel merchants meaning these merchants are not traditionally online but are now becoming online because the need of the are and you are enabling them to do so you took one example in the last quarter call probably tupperware So are there a significant proportion of parcels that are originating from these? And the question is important because these are not affected by e-commerce funding uh, situation. These are sort of running on stream, as you said, online buying scheme. Yeah, I'm going to let Sandeep answer this question. Sandeep, go ahead. Sure. Um, thanks for that question, Lokesh. Um, so, um, you know, when we look at when we bucket D two C and SME segment together, that actually includes mostly. companies that are not necessarily just e-commerce but also traditional brands that are now starting to actually go online um so again most likely to be unaffected by any funding issues uh, plus people who actually are asking us to pick up from store rather than pick up from warehouse now i cannot tell you exactly what number what is the volume of shipments that we pick up from store versus pick up from warehouse but is there an increasing salience of shipments coming from non traditional e-commerce absolutely i know it's an odd thing to say non traditional e-commerce but that is definitely uh, uh, growing um and even on e-commerce bulk of our shipments do not come from the two large platforms um we don't actually have that degree of concentration uh, in our business because we work across all the large platforms including some of the vertical players who are actually quite scaled up as well um and quite well funded so yes but to your base question absolutely d2c and sme and omni channel is clearly becoming a greater salience on our overall business sure thanks i'll get back to the queue thank you next question is from the line of vijay jain from city please go ahead uh, thank you uh, can you hear me yes yeah thank so i have two questions on the e-commerce business uh, one uh, in the same day delivery offering is there a pricing differential or significant pricing differential per parcel that exists between that and conventional offering and uh, the second question related to uh, you know the price hike that you took with the aggregators earlier this quarter uh, i'm just wondering uh, to address the aggregators do you need to do more than that Uh, over the next year uh, does it include uh, you know ramping up sales presence to on board the long tail or do you need to build uh, or offer channel integration so just your thoughts on uh, how you are addressing aggregators sure on uh, same day delivery pricing yes same day delivery is charged at a premium to regular delivery uh, and especially same day delivery originating out of micro fulfillers is charged at a premium to regular delivery uh the premium varies depending on the volume and depending on the specific city in which we are operating because you know costs for this are different across for instance metros versus non metro cities and we have 15 cities that we are currently operational in to your second question uh, i'll go back to my earlier answer which is that uh, we don't particularly see anything that we have to do differently for clients above a certain size customers above a certain size are better served working directly with not just delivery but other logistics companies as well and typically the systems that they have will be capable of allowing them to manage more than one logistics partner it also is more effective because logistics partners whether delivery or others have the ability to provide greater customization of services you know when working directly with these customers so we don't think that we have to add any capabilities those are capabilities that logistics companies have uh as far as the aggregators go they are they are a good sales channel not just for us but for all other logistics companies in the market for merchants who are below a certain size but after merchants cross a certain size threshold delivery and other logistics companies across the country typically will see customers approaching us directly and to integrate directly 
Got it. Thanks. And my second question is uh, just that comment about the impact of Shopee in 1Q. I think uh, you mentioned 22 million parcels and about a 60 crore impact on service data. Uh, did, I, did I understand that right? So it basically translates to 27 rupees per parcel of uh, service data impact from uh, Shopee. The overall impact that you saw on that slide of 60 crores also includes some impact uh, due to revenue loss in the part truckload business at constant service at the margin. But broadly for Shopee, I think uh, the numbers will be closer to about 40 to 50 crores in terms of uh, revenue led reduction. Well, thanks. Uh, and uh, one final question. Uh, could you, just a housekeeping question for my side. Uh, could you give a number for the CAPEX for the quarter and the HCF uh, for the quarter? Amit, can you take that, yeah. please? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the total use of cash in this quarter was about uh, 215 crore rupees. Uh, out of this, about uh, 75 crore was uh, attributable to cash flow from operations. About uh, 220. Uh, uh, 5 crore was uh, capex uh, and there was about uh, excluding the ipo proceeds there was about net uh, uh, drawdown and uh, some receipt of uh, money from uh, uh, from particular investor was about uh, related to tax indemnity was about 85 crore rupees so adjusting all these things the total use of cash in the quarter was about 215 crore rupees Thanks, Amit. Uh, those were my questions. I'll jump back into the queue. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from Ankit Jain from Mira Asset from Webcast. Hi, team. Couple of questions. Any sense on possible loss of revenue in PTL business for the quarter due to integration? Two, reason behind yield per parcel for the coming off. In express parcel, business to around 59 versus 72 in FI22. Any impact on service of beta and core express business as a result of the same? And third, nature of one-time provision cost of 40 CR. Sure, Ankit, just on the first question, when you're talking about possible loss of revenue, do you mean permanent loss of revenue or only in the quarter? Okay, so let's assume it's for the quarter. Yeah, so for the quarter, if you look at uh, our overall, if I can direct you to the slide, Apar, if you can go to slide number three, which has the PTL revenues quarter four versus quarter one. Yeah, so if you look at the graph at the bottom right, what you will see is that part truckload freight revenues have dropped from 482 crores in quarter four financial 22 to 260 crores in quarter one financial 23. So the net impact has been close to about 223 crores between quarter four and quarter one. Uh, a bulk of this was related to the integration related issues earlier in the quarter and we're seeing volume recovery and we're seeing revenue recovery and expect this to continue through this quarter and forward. The second question uh, in terms of Yield per parcel, the yield per parcel is a mix, is driven by a mix of clients, is driven by a mix of distances that packages are traveling. Uh, and so as that shifts, the yield naturally shifts across quarters. For example, we are likely to see an increase in yield again in quarter three uh, during the Diwali period, but that's just a natural cyclicality in the business. In terms of impact on service habitat and the core express business, again, if I can direct you to the table that we had put up on the adjusted EBITDA bridge, Afar, if you can go to that. Uh, no, the, the one which goes from 81 crores to negative 217. The, the under, yeah. So our express and our part truckload businesses that mentioned share the same resources, whether it is infrastructure, whether it's staffing or whether it's fleet. So our mid-mile facilities, for example, or our trucks are running a combination of express as well as PTL. And so a decline in the PTL volumes that are flowing through the network will have a natural impact on overall transportation EBITDA. And therefore, if you were to do an allocation would also affect express service EBITDA in that period. Um, so 
the impact from the core express business has come from the integration rather than a change in yield. The express business is designed so that the margins are constant irrespective of a change in mix of the network. So had our PTL volumes remained at their quarter four levels, even with a decline in the express yield because of a change in mix, the margins would have remained constant or would have grown with time. In terms of the nature of one-time provisions of 40 crores, it's, uh, these are largely claims which are related to specific uh, outcomes. One is uh, through this period, there were excess damages that were created in our network as the delivery and the spot-on network were combined. And the second was extraordinary package losses or package delays uh, owing to integration issues coming out of Taudu and Vivandi, where we've essentially uh, provided uh, we've essentially provided these uh, as discounts back to our customers, which are a one-time integration expense. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Saurabh Duggar from Motilal Oswal. Please go ahead. Good evening, sir, and congratulations on integration of Spoton. So my questions have uh, uh, been answered previously. Just wanted to clarify, like on a Q on Q and a Y O Y basis, if we remove the spot on integration, what would be the EBITDA and margin? And uh, second question would be, what would be the contribution of spot on on the overall uh, FI23 revenues and FI24 revenue and margin? Thank you. Sure. Again, if I can just direct you to the apart, if you can go back to the bridge from 81 crores to minus 217. Yeah. So broadly to your question, uh, if you remove the integration impact on this slide, the costs that disappear are the 150 crore cost, which is under utilization of existing capacity. Obviously, the 46 crores, which are the one-time integration costs, and a portion of the revenue-led reduction in service beta which we expect will be likely in the range of about 20 to 25 crores. So 150 plus 46 is 196 plus about 25. So essentially we would have been at an adjusted EBITDA break even had we shown zero growth uh, between quarter four and quarter one. So if our quarter one volumes in PDL had remained exactly the same as quarter four and we take into account the disappearance of Shopee with uh, overall express parcel volumes being at 150 million, uh, we should have been at broadly a break, break even in quarter one financial 23. So the costs that would have persisted, the other way, other way to think about it is that the costs which would have persisted would have been the 21 crore capacity addition during uh, quarter one, the inflation impact of 17 crores, and a part of the revenue-led reduction in service EBITDA to the extent of Shopee's disappearance, which would have been close to about 40, 45 crores. Uh, to your second question, in terms of how much does spot on form, uh, what I can tell you is that the overall part truckload business, if you go back two slides apart, please. The overall part truckload business was at about a quarter of our revenues in quarter one financial 22 and quarter four financial 22, as you can see, which has declined to 15% as of quarter one financial 23 owing to the integration. Uh, and so our expectation would be that as volumes recover, first of all, it would form similar percentage of our overall revenues as it has in financial 22. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Shashank Savla from Sombras Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi there. Thanks uh, for the opportunity. Um, my question was more on the breakdown of the margins between the different segments. So I, I know you don't provide a, an exact number, but given that a lot of the extra cost have been related to the part truck load business, I wanted to understand if the margin trend in the other businesses is improving over time as your business is getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, so Shashank, broadly the answer is yes. As you can see, and as I pointed out earlier, we run an integrated network where the substantially the biggest costs that are shared between the two networks are the mid-mile costs, which are the trucking terminals and the hub, and outside of that uh, line hall, or the trucking network itself. We don't break that down between express and part truck load. And so obviously, when there is a decline in the part truckload volumes, we decided to continue running 
the trucking network with the same capacities to ensure fast service recovery and to ensure express was not affected. And so there would have been a margin impact on both express as well as PTL. As PTL volumes have recovered, margins have also recovered across both the express as well as the PTL service lines, and they will continue to improve as PTL volumes continue to grow. Right. And the the bottlenecks and the one-off costs which you men mentioned, is there any impact in the second quarter as well from that? In terms of the uh, service levels, service levels have remained stable more or less since the end of quarter one of financial 23 and have remained robust. So we're not seeing any sort of bottlenecks across the network. I think there continue to be one or two smaller locations where the delivery and the spot on networks have not been fully integrated. And because of sort of the lease terms, we continue to carry redundant facilities which will be integrated. So one location, for example, specifically would be Chennai, where both delivery and spot on operate subscale sub facilities and therefore substandard for the size of the business that we intend to run. And that integration will take a period of time. But outside of that, uh, we don't see these bottlenecks continuing across the network. Margin, impact on, impact on margin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and other than that, I think your question was, do we expect the one-time expenses from quarter one to continue through the rest of the year? Yes. We expect yes. some. So I was just trying to understand: uh, Is there any ongoing impact in the second quarter as well from the one-offs or the issues we men you mentioned in the first quarter? I think a large percentage of the claims have been settled with customers in quarter one. Some of them will be settled in quarter two, and post that, we don't expect there to be significant sort of persistence of the one-time integration costs. Those will not continue. As volumes recover, so, I want to point out that, that, that the provisions for them have been made in the quarter one itself. Yeah. Right. Okay. And and uh, finally, uh, is there any guidance uh, which you are willing to provide in terms of or any targets for what your revenue growth or profit uh, EBITDA margin targets would be for this year or next year? I think it's still too early for us to provide uh, annual guidance at this point. It's important for us to see how the next quarter plays out as well. Uh, and then obviously we're entering the peak season, so we'll have a much better sense of how the year will play out. In terms of what the economics of the business will generally look like, I think you can look at our quarter three and our quarter four results uh, and our financials for the previous financial year. In that sense, our business is not very difficult uh, to model. We've retained the same capacity, and as volumes go up, that's what our margin trend should look like. Right. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Alok Deshpande from Edelweiss Securities. Please. Go uh, hi. A uh, couple of questions from my side. Uh, first, uh, uh, I know the, the, that you've quantified the Shopee impact, but uh, generally speaking, over the last two or three years, uh, what is the typical trend of uh, you know shipment volumes from quarter four to quarter one? Uh, you know, so so like you mentioned, if you said just for the Shopee volumes, it could have been the similar number of 150 million shipments. But historically, uh, how does this trend move from quarter four to quarter one? That's question number one. Broadly flat. Hello. Okay. So Understood. In line with, and, uh, in line with what we've seen, where you know the 150 million odd that we did, excluding Shopee for quarter four, has remained flat in quarter one. What is different this time, I should point out though, is that the industry has degrown between quarter four and quarter one because of Shopee. Right, and 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 even historically, uh, would this uh, flat volumes be more because of delivery getting more market share because? Uh, from an industry perspective, I would think that Q1 would be lower than Q4. Is that a fair assumption? No, there's no reason to um, assume that because Q1 actually tends to be fairly non-consequential quarter in general, right? Because there's no sales, there's no festive uh, reasons. April, May, June is actually quite quite drab in India in all in all sense, right? Because if you have your year-end sales that happens in March, um, your next round of sales starts with end-of-season sales for fashion, which is in July followed by Republic Day. Um, even your Prime Day happens in July. Uh, Flipkart Founders Day happens in Q2. April, May, June tends to be very, very soft. There's cool holidays in India. 
there's not much going on in April, May, June. So there's not really that much activity in April, May, uh, 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 May, June. Um, so it tends to be uh, it tends to be uh, more or less uh, more or less flat there. Um, last couple of years are not a good example, simply because both year before uh, two years ago would have been impacted by COVID. Um, but in general, it's, it's it's flat or slightly below Q4. Sure, got it, understood. And uh, the second question is on uh, you know there is a statement in your filing which says that. Uh, uh, the some some part of this uh, you know uh, impact on margins and volumes will continue in the next quarter also that is quarter two. Uh, now are we looking at uh, a very uh, small part of this integration process carrying on in Q2 or uh, are we looking at an impact which is sort of similar to Q1? I think we've seen recovery of volumes in. Q2 overall as two things have happened. One is that as claims were settled with customers, uh, more customers have started trading. B, I think as service levels have stabilized and as our, as our confidence in the automated facilities increased towards the end of quarter one, we also have started admitting larger volumes into the network. And so volume recovery has continued through July and into August so far. That said, like I said, it's still early. Uh, the volume recovery is continuing. We're satisfied with where we're at. Uh, it's still a little early to predict exactly what will happen in Q2 because we will have to see how volumes grow in August and uh, and sort of the later part of September when we're approaching the festive season. It's also a quarter end uh, in September, so we'll see what the impact of that will be. So there will be some impact which will continue from underutilization, but we expect Q2 to be better than Q1, yes. Okay. Uh any any sense, Sail, on uh, whether we are guiding on uh, FY23 overall? No numbers or no no margin number, but uh, are you confident of having a existed a bit of positive FY23? Uh, any any sense on that? It's too early to say right now. Yeah. Let's we have to look at how the rest of the year will play out, and we have to see sort of how volumes play out for the rest of the year. As long as there are no further systemic shocks. I think you know we should be doing fine, but it's still early. Sure, got it. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Abhishek from DSP Investment Managers. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Sahil. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Sahil, just one question, just referring to the bridge that you'll have given and. You know, for the PTL segment, what revenues we have seen almost about a 223 crores decline on a sequential basis, a corresponding impact of almost about 150 crores uh, X of provision, and if you include 140 crores of provision, it's almost about 190 crores. Is that a high number? Because just for a corresponding revenue decline of 223 crores sequentially, uh, seeing an EBITDA impact of almost about 150 crores excess provision and with provision 190. Is that a high number or is there something else that we have to look at? Just your thoughts. I think the way you have to look at our business, and we pointed this out last time as well, is that we're an extremely high incremental margin business. And therefore, when volumes drop sharply, it's not unusual to actually see that uh, the drop in the PTL revenues is causing that extent of uh, capacity under utilization. The other thing to point out is that the capacity under utilization cost that you're seeing of 150 crores also, as I pointed out, includes certain facilities that are redundant and some contracts on the spot on side, which we will sunset through this year. So to some extent that 150 crores is also impacted by that. As you've seen, we've already started the process of deprecating certain facilities, consolidating facilities between delivery and spot on. We made progress on that in Q1. That will continue through Q2, and our hope is that a bulk of that will get consummated through Q2 and the early part of Q3. Okay. So to that extent, we should also see a very sharp recovery when these revenues come back to maybe fourth two levels and a little higher than that. That was my point that I just wanted. Sure. Okay. Uh, the other thing is also, uh, you know, obviously we have seen the increase in corporate overhead as a percentage of revenues a little higher because of the underutilization. But should this normalize? To your, you know, uh, uh, earlier numbers of less than uh, seven, eight percent as things normalize over the course of the year. Is that a fair assumption to me? Yes. Okay. So there is no uh, change in in that kind of uh, the overhead uh, uh, 
absorption is that you're confident that you're able to maintain those seven percent kind of number going forward? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Great. Just the other thing in terms of since you're also starting the uh, you know the day service, I just wanted to get an understanding. Will that also mean mean that at some point in time you'll also have to kind of get into own freighters or anything of that sort and just be able to provide a daily service on a any cost in that? Not at all. Uh, as we discussed on the last call as well, uh, I think we are one of the largest uh, shippers of air freight domestically on passenger belly. I think uh, passenger, you know, as passenger traffic has recovered and fleet sizes are increasing, the capacity that's available to shippers like us is increasing as well, and we are a priority partner for all of the airlines in India. So we don't see the need for us to go out and invest in freighters. Um, you know, certain segments of the market may remain unaddressable for us by virtue of not having freighters, but those are segments of the market that we don't feel are large enough or attractive enough for us to really be in. Oh, great. And just one last question. In terms of you mentioned about some of the, uh, you know, customer wins, you have mentioned a couple of uh, sectoral names. I guess those are referring to the third party part of the business, right? That's right. That's the supply chain services. That's correct. Okay. And how has been the pricing and your expected yield in that? Because uh, since now you are, you know, you are a much uh, formidable player and you are also getting gaining in terms of revenue. So how has been the yield experience as far as the new wins are concerned uh, from the uh, earlier ones? Are you are you referring to supply, supply chain services yield? I, I am referring to supply chain services service in particular. Yeah, so supply chain services yield one client versus another client are not really comparable because. You know the, the kind of movements and the kind of work we do for a client might be very very different from uh, from a client, and also the requirements from warehousing and what the requirement from warehousing actually varies a lot. The degree of primary and secondary movement varies a lot. So they're not strictly comparable. But as I think earlier question was asked, and Tyle pointed to that, that are the other businesses actually improving in 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 their overall margin performance? Supply chain is experiencing the same overall level. Um, so you know we are being able to price better. Be able to get a better margin out of that business, but you can't really. It's not. A, it's not like a parcel where you connect by one one parcel versus another parcel. But the quality of the contracts are definitely improving as we go and get more and more contracts. Oh, great! Thank you so much for answering. And wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Abhijit Mitra from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So again, uh, you know, just go back to that, uh, you know, bridge between 81 crores and negative 217 crores, just to sort of uh, check my understanding. So, uh, the negative 150 crores of underutilization of existing capacity essentially has four components, right? So, you have capacity creation in search of future demand, the typical of Q1, looking into Q2, Q3, Q4. So that would be probably recurring every Q1. Second is your redundant capacities of spot on, right? Um, what you will sort of gradually taper down, inclusive of employees, I guess. I think employees also, I can see a lowering trend. Third is, uh, you know, normalcy of volumes in PTL. Now, this looks like a one month impact. You're expecting normalcy in June, but the customer volumes are slow to sort of resume. Um, and then uh, fourth impact on account of, you know, sudden drop in uh, uh, shoppy volumes. So these are the four impacts, right? And and depending on 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 you know normalization of each of those four um, things, you will sort of see this 150 crore uh, play out over the rest of the year. That's correct. The incremental capacity addition that you refer to as the first of the four is the 21 crores that we have pointed out here. Here, that is the typical sort of normal capacity addition that will happen in quarter one. Okay. So underutilization of existing capacity, which is the 150 crores, is as you had pointed out, the excess capacity that was created for two reasons. One is continuing to have redundant infrastructure uh, between delivery and spot on. And the second is that as volumes drop sharply, we decided to continue to keep that capacity to stabilize service levels faster, and which is sort of played out because service levels have been stable since the end of quarter one and remained robust throughout. So that will normalize this year. Uh, the third, obviously, is the inflation impact, which is, again, an annual cost that we take in. And the final one, which is the revenue-led reduction, is because of Shopee. That's correct. 
Yeah, and just to sort of uh, focus a bit on the KPIs, I think there's a slide where you have beautifully depicted the KPIs. Uh, so there is one item which is revenue per square feet. So here, uh, you know, my sense is you have taken only the warehousing revenue. Is it true? As in, uh, is, is my understanding right? You have not taken the transportation part uh, within the supply chain. Uh. Amit, can you answer yes, the question? Right. Yes, you are right. This is only so the here, warehousing. Here, here you are actually breaking it up into warehousing and transportation, right? So the transportation revenue per square feet corresponds to the uh, revenue divided by the square feet of uh, uh, transportation infrastructure we operate. Uh, and warehousing revenue attributes to the warehousing revenue divided by the uh, warehousing square feet we have. So warehousing component within the supply chain business? Yes. yes. Got it, got it. That's all from my side. Thanks. Thank you. Next question is from Aditya Mongya from Codex Securities from Webcast. Given the majority market share and express parcel that delivery has, what is the end game for delivery's market share within three PL players over the next few years? And what three PL market share does it make sense for delivery start growing pricing? Any sense of timelines for the same to start reflecting in the financials? What is your stance on prospects of utilizing your PTL infrastructure capacity towards growing slow PTL business. Would that not be return or margin dilutive versus deploying such capacity to grow express PTL business faster? So, um, Aditya, hi, it's Sandeep. Thank you for the question. Um, let me answer the first question and then time maybe we can come back and talk about the PTL portion. Um, on, ex on express portal, you know, you know, we are the largest player in the market. We have the largest market share and we've been gaining share in the market. I think it's hard to say what the logical endpoint is of, of market share in this, uh, in, 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 uh, for us because while customers done and partner, it's not clear whether they need three partners and four partners and whether, you know, at some point we thought, you know, customers will have, you know, 20% shares or 25% shares to each partner, but we, we are breaking that. And we have customers who actually give us 70, 80, 90% share of volume and we have customers who give us 35, 40% share of volume. So I think our objective is, is going to be to continue driving down cost and improving service level, and then tactically pricing into the market to see how much of that we want to gain uh, from a share perspective and how much of that we want to invest towards, actually or how much do we want to keep as, as, as margin. And we'll come, continue doing that over the next few years. And it's not, I don't think we have in mind a logical point that at 30% share we will, you know, we'll start pricing up or 35% share we'll start pricing up. I think there's clear margin, opportunity for us to gain share and we'll continue to gain share. We clearly see opportunity to further rationalize cost and bring efficiency into the system. And as long as we see that, there's no reason for us to keep uh, uh, not gain share. Um, at what point do we start pricing up? I don't know whether it's the question of whether we need to price up parcel to actually make money or make margins. It's actually how much more efficiency can we get from the system. So there's still more we can push through the pipe uh, efficiently before we have to start actually pricing up. Um, I think the benefit of this is going to be that there's going to be a point at which you know, our pricing ability versus competitors will, will, will actually be very, very, very differentiated. And then it, then you will see the real share gain for us, whether it's, you know, and, and there's no limit to how, how high that can be. Um, at least we are not setting a limit for ourselves. Um, so I think that's where we have to focus on. I don't think in the short term, the game is of, 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 of having to increase prices. We can get margin through reducing cost and putting more through the pipe. Uh, and that's what we'll do. Um, how when will this start reflecting in the financials? As you know, Tyler has mentioned a couple of times today already, we are an integrated network uh, with high incremental uh, uh, margins. Um, I think both PTL, Express PTL, and Express Parcel have to play uh, in tandem uh, for that to start reflecting effectively in, in, our, in, our, in our margins. Um, Sai, do you want to talk about part truck load and how you want to think about Yeah, that? it's a good question on uh, utilizing the PTL infrastructure capacity. I think I, I would just point out one thing, which is that it's not the PTL infrastructure capacity. It's the combined capacity that we've created in mid-mile operations, which is the hubs as well as the trucking network. 
And the way to think about how we will grow the economy, PTL business, the way we think about it is that it's not, I will repeat double bold and underline that it is not a standalone capability that we intend to build. So the objective is not to go out and compete with, you know, traditional economy PTL players where there is a sort of fairly fragmented and large space and to build an independent economy PTL business. There are certain locations which our express network services where it is possible for us to drive up utilization of the vehicles by developing an economy PTL business because in those locations an express PTL business may not exist at all. And in some locations where, for example, the average utilization provides us enough space to go and develop specific accounts in specific verticals, which we are aware of. And sometimes the same shippers end up having a combination of express PTL and economy PTL requirements, which our intention is to serve. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Polkit Patni from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for taking my questions. So my first question is, is you know, if we just take a step back and look at on the PTL side in Q1 FY22, we did 279,000 tons. That number after spot on is now 239,000 tons. So, I, I mean, while I understand there's been integration issues, but how come the volumes are even below what we used to do uh, pre-spot on? Uh, so if you could just help understand that better, uh, because uh, and without spot on, we could have done similar numbers, if not more. Uh, that would be my first question. The 279,000 tons, can you just open up that slide, please, Apa? Just to be clear, the 279,000 tons for quarter one of fiscal 22 will be pro forma, so that will also include spot on. The delivery standalone volumes are not 279,000 tons. So in that sense, the delivery, uh, when you compare the delivery of your business to quarter one financial 23, the business has grown in the same period. The reason for the decline is essentially us cutting out volumes in specific locations. The two highest volume locations from which we cut out volumes were where we have the largest automated gateways to allow the network to stabilize, which were out of our gateway in Taudu and out of our gateway in Vivendi and therefore also cutting out certain locations which connect into these major locations. So for example, Pune connects via Vivandi. And so making sure that we provide a standard service quality and cut volume. So that's why you see the cut in volumes in quarter one financial 23. Makes sense. Uh, and, and related question on realization, once the integration of spot on is fully complete, uh, is there a possibility we could have higher realization, given that some of this also is is a realignment of, of uh, clients, et cetera? Or do we expect realizations to be? So the line for the participant dropped. I think his question was, do we expect realizations in the part truckload business to remain broadly constant? I think, again, realization in the part truckload business, and I'm answering this for the benefit of everybody else on the call, is again a mix of all of the different clients who form the part truck road business. It's a combination of a mix of our corporate, our retail, and our small and medium businesses. And as those percentages change, the realization of the part truck road business changes as well. That said, pricing in the part truck road business is something that is sort of well discovered. It's a market that has existed for a long period of time. And so to that extent, what we do is to follow market pricing. Our approach will be similar to what we did in Express, which is to be the most efficient player. And therefore, over a period of time, either have margins which are super normal compared to other competitors in this space, or to pass on pricing benefits to customers. Thank you. I now hand the conference over to Gaurav Daria from Morgan Stanley. I, uh, maybe I can just uh, chip in one question here. Uh, on the PTL volumes, uh, where are we now versus the normalized volumes by when we expect to get back to the uh, 4Q levels? And a related question is that for fiscal 23, would PTL volume would remain constant or it will kind of uh, has uh, still potential to grow because uh, we have lost out some time now? 
I think, Gaurav, it's still early to say. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, seen service levels be con uh, completely stable since the end of quarter one financial 23. And the operational issues at Tauru and Vivandi have been sort of conclusively resolved. So they've remained stable uh, into quarter two so far. We don't anticipate any disruption coming from this. The reason I, I'm not yet uh, going to provide a forecast on what our volumes will be for the year or what our recovery will be is that one of the hypotheses we had is that as the delivery and spot on network combined and as we discovered efficiency by combining the two networks and additional capacity, you know, we might be able to grow faster than we had originally planned as well. But at this point in time, you know, we let me put it this way, the operational issues are behind us. We settled claims with our key customers in quarter one. Whatever few claims were left will be settled through quarter two. We are seeing volume recovery through quarter two and we're quite satisfied with where we are where we're at. Um, and we'll see sort of at the end of this quarter how the rest of the financial year will play out. All right, second question was on the synergy benefit on integration and upgradation of the network on trailers. Uh, when does that really start to flow in, into the margins and any uh, quantification of uh, integration related benefit that we can see? Sure, as I pointed out in our previous earnings call also, Gaurav, our aim was by the end of this financial year to first of all take the combined PTL business post integration to the pre-integration margins that spot on had. Uh, so that continues to remain our target. There's no change in that target, uh, you know, the integration issues of quarter one notwithstanding. And then to start discovering synergies, because I think that's the period that it will take for us to eliminate all redundant infrastructure to ensure that there's complete consolidation of facilities and teams. So that process is underway. That continues to remain our target, which is to get the business to uh, pre-integration spot on standalone margins in this financial year and then to start discovering synergies. In terms of tractor trailers, we continue to induct tractor trailers across our network. Uh, as you've seen, we've inducted close to about 30 tractors and 85 trailers in quarter one. We will continue to do that. And as volumes are going up, those tractor trailers are replacing a relatively less efficient 32 foot single axle and 32 foot multi axle vehicles. And so that movement will continue through the year. And the difference in costing, for example, in line haul between the tractor trailer operations and the 32 foot single and multi axle trucks can be as high as 25%. So we expect to continue to see those efficiencies as tractor trailers come in. All right, those are all the questions I had. So uh, on behalf of uh, Morgan Stanley, I thank the management team of uh, Delivery for the detailed insights and their time. Thanks everyone else for uh, joining the call. Over to you, Nirav. Thank you very much. On behalf of Morgan Stanley, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines. Thank, thank you all. Thank you for joining us.